What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to The Big Thing, Capes and Cows. Going to be a very stacked show here today, ladies and gentlemen, as we are going to be talking about Henry Cavill. That's right. Henry Cavill is rumored for a Marvel role. We know that. Well, there's some rumors about what he could potentially be doing. And we'll go into this comic book movie story about some of the potential roles that they think he would fit well in. We'll see if we agree or just dis disagree. The new Crow trailer just came out. We actually did a reaction to it, um, and we'll discuss it. Speaking of things that are coming out, the people are psyched about X-Men 97. All three of us have seen the first three episodes. We'll talk about that, and we'll also talk about the fact that the showrunner fired days before the premiere, and if that's going to affect the show moving forward. Someone's sticking up for Batman. There's some pushback on Zack Snyder's comments about Batman, and surprisingly enough, it's not Koi Jandra. <laughs> what? Uh, yeah, Venom 3 gets a title. This and more. On the show here today, if you're brand new to the show and you've never been here before, do us a favor. Hit that button. Subscribe to the channel. We do a comic book movie news show, just the one we're doing right now, every Friday. We have other shows that we do. We do a live show on Monday. We have a UAP show on Tuesday. We do some stuff on Wednesdays and Thursdays. And out of the theater reactions, Winston and I did one of those last night for X-Men. Um, reviews, a lot of it. So we have so much. And if you do like the, or you're curious about the UAP phenomenon, UFOs, Check out my new channel, Down Earth with Christian Harloff, where you just hit 14,000 subscribers on that channel, and we do daily news every day, so we hope that you'll join us over there. We're on Apple Podcasts, we're on Spotify, we do all that stuff. All right, it's Capes and Cows, everybody. Let's do it. Here we go. Well, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Capes and Cows, Christian Harloff, Boy Jandro. Winston A. Marshall. To me, my X-Men. And yeah, was, at first I was like, who are you, Cyclops? He's like, no, 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 it's the long-haired Magneto. I <laughs> love long-haired Magneto. Dude, I love that hairdo. Dude, it's, yeah. it luxurious. It's really, it really is elegant. He looks like it? he smells like sandalwood. <laughs> 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 just has an ambiance about him. It's just so, carries himself. It's, it's so good. Sandalwood and cigars. Yeah. <laughs> it's just got a vibe, man. What I don't understand, though, I'll tell you this, is that you, you guys know me more so than the three of us. I like to... I'm, Politics and things of that nature. I hate when when people are so blatant about it on on Twitter and Instagram and and on award ceremonies and everything too. But when I see someone go, "Well, the X Men are, are too political," and this X Men this X Men series looks woke, I'm like, ha "Have you ever read an X Men comic?" Real talk. The the, the whole <laughs> the whole thing started off as they were the definition of woke, <laughs> which, which is funny because that's not even what the anyway. Yeah, it started off as an allegory for the civil rights movement, and right. then it further pushed into LGBTQ rights and everything else. And they've never hidden that. It's always been there. ever. The whole thing is like yeah, we're. It's not subtle. No, it's like we're it, we're different. We have to come out to our parents to let them know we're different. A lot of our, a lot of the parents are like, "Get them out of here! You take them," mm -hmm. and all the shit that was going. It's like, it's like, what, what are you watching? It's like, because, because I saw some, because we we talked about last night on on our out of the theater reaction. I said, "Look, this is this sticks true to what the X Men do, and it's this political um, kind of commentary overall, and they stick to that." And someone goes, "Oh, politics? Uh, I'm out." I'm like, "Well, wait, you've wait, never wait, seen they said that in the comments." Yeah, the the comments. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like. <laughs> I'm like, look, it's one thing if it's like if like if someone does a weekend to Bernie remake, weekend at Bernie's remake, and it's like, dude, this whole thing is very like politically. Like, why? Why yeah, did they make that weekend at Bernie's? Why? But if you make a political thriller and it's political, perhaps it wasn't for you. Right. I so I that one I didn't understand. I didn't get that because those people don't deserve art. Like if you're that dumb, you don't deserve to be entertained. I, it, what it, it's Media literacy is at an all-time low. Again, yeah. stupid that's, people that's, don't deserve nice things. But, but, but I, I do think there's an argument sometimes. I'll tell you sometimes when it's just like, oh, the politics on this, you're just going sure. towards one but lane. We're, we're not talking about that. We're no. talking about like the right. comprehension of, of a this, commentary of, of, of the X-Men. <laughs> you brought up well, politics, Chris. Yeah, I know. What I will say is this, though. I will say that there's sometimes, though, when people, when, and you see it a lot lately, that studios don't understand that you got to you got to go to both sides of the aisle mm. and they have not been doing that recently they are they've been going one side of the aisle it's true but when it comes to x-men it's always been this is what it is so either way let's talk about let's start with that we'll start with x-men 97 because we're already there all right everybody x-men 97 gets glowing first reactions amid shocking showrunner firing 
This is from Mark Cassidy over at Comic Book Movie. The first social media reactions to the three-episode premiere of Marvel Studios' animated revival series X-Men 97 have been shared online following creator Bo DeMeo's recent firing. Marvel Studios' animated revival series X-Men 97 made headlines earlier this week after a somewhat shocking development, the firing of showrunner Bo DeMeo, just days away from the show's Disney Plus premiere on March 20th. DeMeo, who previously worked on Moon Knight as well as early drafts of the upcoming Blade reboot, is said to have parted ways suddenly with Marvel last week. No reason for this falling out was given, but DeMeo's company email and Instagram have been deactivated, and cast and crew have been reportedly informed that he is no longer on the project. We still don't know exactly what led to him being taken off the project. There are rumors that it might have something to do with his OnlyFans account, but X-Men 97 is now back in the news for a more positive reason. Following the show's three-episode premiere, critics have been sharing their first reactions to social media, and what sounds a little more like a few nitpicks aside, they are glowing. Jamie Jirak from Cin Jamie Cinematics says, The first three episodes of X-Men 97 are epic. It exceeds expectations in every way. The nostalgia is strong, but it's just so much more. Beautiful animation, excellent storytelling, and above all, my favorite thing about the X-Men is the drama. James Whitbrook. Okay, now I can say that I've seen the first three episodes. It's on the whole good, a solid continuation, but that means it has a few of the show's stumbling points, too. When it's great, it's great, and so far that it's more often than not, Scott fans will be feasting. Everybody just loving on it. The official synopsis says Storm and Wolverine try to continue the X-Men. Magneto comes in and wants to step up for Charles. Sinister comes in and try to end the X-Men once and for all. Um, okay, so we've all seen this. Okay, so you guys have watched the series. Lead I know that you have for sure. You watched the, the entire lead up going up to you. Yeah. You watched. So I hadn't. I didn't, didn't rewatch, but I've seen them. You've seen them. Yeah, I didn't. I, I rewatch it like every eighteen months. So I remember it. I think that you guys were were kids when this thing was on, and I mm -hmm. was like, I I was a teenager mm -hmm. or, or or little little later. I don't know. When did it come out? Ninety six. No, ninety two to ninety six. Ninety two to ninety six. So I was like, I was in high school. So mm -hmm. you know, I was like, so when I, I noticed it was on like I think my brother watched it you know and I would like notice it was, it was on and I was an X-Men comics fan so I remember like if, if it was on and I tuned and I saw it I was like oh yeah this is, this is cool uh, and I always remember it I remember that theme everybody remembers the theme and so I didn't really remember enough the storylines um, so when I was watching Winston Winston would say oh yeah this happened in in the, the finale of like season whatever it was five or whatever and very easy to catch up to especially if you know the X-Men it felt approachable without very much so cool. I loved this series. I loved the first three episodes that I saw. It was because I'm an X-Men fan, right? It made me excited. Made me, what we were talking about. Just the feeling of talking about X-Men again. lead with X-Men. They got to be everywhere. They got to do, and, I'm, and I'll push back because I know that there's at least 10 of you that does this every time. So let's do it. Michael Keaton style to Danny DeVito and Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> I'll tell you right, I'm going to do it every time. A, the X-Men should have single movies leading to one X-Men event. Come on and disagree with me. I love when you do it because you're wrong. Um, it, they should all have their own single movies, especially when you see the detail that Rogue has and Storm has, and they can all lead up in the same way that Captain America did and Tony did, and you lead up to a big X-Men event. I would push back on that. I, you, well, you're wrong. No, but I'm going to tell you why. I'll, yeah. give you a, I'll give you a better I'll give you a better way to do that because i think it's fine you fart all you want um you get some beano so i would say like with some of these characters they're all very fleshed out in their lore and everything like else like that i think what might be a little bit stronger is if you almost treat it kind of like um if you do kind of like a, a mini series type situation where each one of them gets like a, a werewolf by night like length of their own on TV, yeah. yeah, you said that, but the problem is that you that, that Disney's not doing that right now, and Disney wants to make money. And the other thing is you get you get uh, uh, Captain or what is it, the Marvels, and you get these movies, the Eternals, that no one gives a shit about. Mm -hmm. And when you have the X Men, I would much rather see a Storm movie than I would the Marvels. I would much rather see, you know, a lot of these movies that are coming out. I would much rather see the the because I know it's going to lead to an event that's not multiverse, that's not all this stuff. Sure. It leads to like a super team. I'd say split the difference. I think there are some X Men that deserve their own movies, sure. Storm yeah. especially because right. her cinematic backstory is like why not? Yeah, like we we should have long ago. I think Cyclops. I think certain characters. I don't think if you have a six X Men team, you need X 
that's meant to be the seventh movie. Sure. But I think that somewhere in between, like, you have maybe Cyclops and Gene have a love story. Yeah. Well, look, Ant-Man didn't get a movie until after the first Avengers. So, but you know right. what I mean? Like, yeah. you, like, I would love to see something like a, a love story drama between Scott and Gene that, mm -hmm. that then when we get the X-Men, we know them. A right. Storm gets their own movie. And then you right. get if, to. If you're going to do that, because remember, they tried, Fox tried this previously when they were going to do all their X-Men origin movies, and it started with Wolverine, right. and it was so trash, they canceled Magneto right. and everything after it. And so they put gonna, some of that into the first class movie. They like gave him those three scenes that were going to yeah. be his whole movie, which shows how good that would have been. Exactly. Been. So if you're going to do that, then I don't really agree with anybody maybe other than Logan kind of having his solo whatever, I would say then pair them off. And, and, and if you're going to do it, it's Cyclops and Gene, and so how they ultimately met as part of that first class and you focus on them so it is showing the old the first beginning of it but circus you, life uh nightcrawler i think you could do uh thief into like gambit you, like you gambit can make could, them smaller but, yeah yeah but, like those movies are are ready i guess that's what i was saying is if you if you pair them off like that so then i know we already kind of got a magneto and charles story but if you're redoing this for the mcu you could do one with that and right. their friendship leading right. up to the split um, you know, I, I guess you could do that, but like the idea of, for example, having a Jubilee movie. I, no, no, I, I'm, I'm not like, saying, but that's not what I'm saying. I, I mean, more so like just like not every X Men should have their own movie, but I mean, in the same way that if you're going to look at the way that they did leading in from phase one, is where Captain America, you know, uh, Thor, they had a couple movies beforehand, and that led into a big event thing because I just don't want it's it's just they're pulling up these obscure characters in Marvel now and doing all these things that it's like there's no. Pure direction, and it, we were way off course. The 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 point is that shows that, great. What, what the show is great. But that's what. But it it starts this conversation. It starts this conversation that show because it shows you how d deep. Like this is a in like a, a different. Um, storyline where you got long-haired Magneto coming back after the events of what happened with Charles and he made a promise to his friends so he's going to come back but they got to trust him and all the, the essence of the X-Men is there mm -hmm. like the stuff that you know about it but there's like if you know any, even if you've just seen the movies you can follow along with this because like oh, okay well that essence of what made Magneto special in the comics that transferred to the movies now transfers back to this this show and there's some really you know, sci-fi stuff that plays mm -hmm. into this, especially like the 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 third episode, and you can either be really on board with. I said it in our out of the theater reaction. Mm. There's a moment at one point you're like, well, they accepted that pretty quick, <laughs> you know. But thirty minute runtime, here right. we are. And yeah, made it thirty minute run, yeah. which is a which nitpick. was always the old show too. Yeah, uh, the old show they had so much lore and they did so many giant arcs. Like I think it's just letting the audience trust in the audience. Yeah. I, what, what the one thing that I think is improved upon in '97 from the OG part of the OG that a lot of people don't know because we were kids and there have actually been a couple of like little documentaries that have come out on it is the amount of production woes that that show faced mm. because Fox didn't really believe in it and it was pitched multiple times mm. and then they finally like kind of let it happen but then there was a delay in animation so you actually got episode two released before episode one and then you kind of had this back and forth where you played the same three episodes for like six months before they eventually and so because of that, there was a lot of disjointed kind of stuff going on. You couldn't fully get into it until we got deeper into the run of the series. Mm -hmm. And then you could really just kind of feast on it. Right. I think they did such a good job because you didn't have that issue of having each episode have its own specific storyline mm -hmm. as we move forward right. as to what is going on with this team post Charles Xavier. And I think someone else mentioned it in their view, but I like that only the first episode felt like it was just getting you back in. I was afraid that, and I enjoyed the first episode, but I was afraid the whole show would feel as nostalgic as sure. the first episode. The show has lots of nostalgia as a character. But it just but throws it you into the storyline. And it doesn't yeah. It doesn't weigh on it. Right. Sometimes nostalgia weighs on a show. Yeah. First episode, I was like, this feels a little too familiar, but then once you got into two, three, it moves. Yeah. It, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that every iteration we've seen where we're being essentially in introduced to the X-Men always starts with some young mutant on the run, yeah. like having to kind of deal with stuff. You and then here comes the team and they try and bring you in like every video game. Every, the, the, this show started, the OG started with Jubilee. Yeah. I'm not going to give away what happens in this first episode, but you have a similar storyline there. Um, the, the Fox movies, you started with Rogue, Rogue on the Rogue run. Rogue is your eyeline. So it's, it is, they, they, they use that as the starting point and that's why I think it probably feels so much like an echo. And it was great for one. Mm -hmm. I was just really, my whole concern about the show 
show was when they called it X Men '97. I was like, how much of this is going to be right. like? Remember, kids, like we yeah. didn't want to remember. Well, a lot of people been, and a lot of people have been doing that lately with yeah. what, when it comes to nostalgia stuff. Yeah. And, and look, I didn't know about what was I was looking at in fresh eyes really sure. so I didn't know that I didn't that's that, why I'm, I was good to hear how approachable it is yeah like everything you said with the first episode you're like oh this is memories to me it was like oh I guess I'm just catching up with stuff and the one thing that I did is because I just know again from X from reading X-Men as as a kid ha knowing friends that worked on the movies and stuff too there were certain things like at one point I won't spoil it but I was like oh that's so-and-so and Winston's like nice and I was like yeah I knew that because <laughs> it, I was actually yeah, very impressed because I because I knew it was once I was like oh yeah that's right that's so-and-so I knew that from the lore and I knew that in general, and I thought they played that really well. But what I what it did for me is that for someone who was like, oh, I'm curious because I like the X Men, I'll watch the show. I don't know if I'll watch the whole series. I want to watch this entire series. So I thought the music was really good, and it felt this. This is a point that I definitely wanted to make here is that we've talked about it how uh, and to the exhaustion the fans are like stop talking about the budgets, which I heard you. Um, but one of the things that I've always talked about is how I want to see like those A24 feel for like RoboCop mm. or like uh, Terminator and smaller budgets. And if you're going to do it like that, make it feel like it was made in 1984. Yeah. This show feels like it was made in 1997. Yeah. And, it, but with like today's cinema angles yes. and, and, and music. Uh, yes. Because it's like use your tools that you have today. Yeah. But if you're going to tell me that it's X-Men 97, make me feel that it's the same animation and it felt exactly the same. Yeah, just, I was it, afraid to be what if too much. Right? Yeah, no, it yeah. just it felt it, it felt like somebody was building a classic car and they did it, but they imp they improved yes. upon it with stuff that we have now. Right. And, and it, it, I thought it was expertly done. Um, I even like I, again for the people that are saying you know okay this is too nostalgia whatever. I think so, two of the really interesting things that they did to make sure it didn't full feel fully like that is a. Um, not not a spoiler in the sense that people know Jubilee's in it. Jubilee now having been the young one that came in with this new mutant that comes in, she ends up being it's this, it's that. Right. Like I've been in your shoes, right? As well as then what the ending of that episode ends up being. Yeah, it really just kind of takes off from there. So where you think you know where this is going, you have zero idea. Is, is the rest of the series the first five? Series, is that on Disney Plus right now? Mm -hmm. Okay, because I probably said what yeah. it, what it did is it, and it's probably going to do this to a lot of people. I want to go back and watch now. Uh, mm -hmm. I was going to say my two favorite elements of this are are what we talked about with getting the X Men back in the conversation and having people go back and like mm -hmm. make that thing, but also the show doesn't feel like other Marvel shows in that a lot of other Marvel shows have some drama and gossip but overall yeah. they're you know telling a narrative an overarching story and there's lots of action this has plenty of action but x-men are dramatic yes they're super gossipy like the x-men are soap like opera it's with action 100 yeah. yeah. this feels like a soap opera with action and it's funny not too, action with a soap opera yeah and there's some funny moments so yeah there's, there's a there's, <laughs> oh, it's a, definitely hilarious. there's, a, there's a really funny moment what's it morph yeah morph, it was a funny thing with that, that morph does to cyclops is what i'll say like in the Third episode is a <laughs> hilarious. Not Cyclops, Gambit. Yeah, it's the, the Gambit. when he does it, the yeah. first episode is Cyclops. Yeah, but that's the Cyclops. It's the Gambit in the third episode that is hilarious. It's it's really good. I yeah. honestly, I think this is the show that's made me smile the biggest and most yeah. of any of the shows. The like stuff. I love, you know, uh, you yeah, guys true. know how much I love Loki and WandaVision yeah, yeah. and the good ones, but they're definitely in a they're a different thing because like they're they did so x-men right you love the x-men and yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's mixing nostalgia with my modern love of them it's right. this perfect blend of like i'm so happy and my inner child is yeah happy. yeah i haven't been this excited about any comic book media i would say since no way home right and i and i loved wakanda forever i loved guardians i love uh uh, uh spider-verse there was, and I, I absolutely adored Spider-Verse. I know for you that it's like top tier, yeah. probably your best comic book movie ever. Um, there was something very just, I guess, specific for No Way Home where, and I guess maybe it's because I also know it's not MCU. Mm. So I think specifically knowing we've been so scared about what's happening with the MCU, and I know it's not a direct tie-in to the MCU, but it is the same camp, I guess, yeah. that, they're, that they're, it feels like if this is the start of writing the ship to go from this to Deadpool, yeah. everybody's going to feel a little bit better about where we're going. Sure, but that does bring us to the elephant in the room. Yeah. And so, Bo was fired. Um, Fire. Now, this guy wrote the majority of the first two seasons, or new seasons, rather, um, and then he was just abruptly fired. We were kind of going over a text thread and as I've been saying lately, something stinks in Denver. Uh, Denver. That's what that's, well, <laughs> instead of Denmark. No, I say Denver. <laughs> I, I've been saying uh, we, this is an ongoing joke. What we've been saying on on with me and Mike, but he has, uh, something stinks in Denver. Um, <laughs> Russell Wilson. Yeah. Oh. So. <laughs> that's but but either way, um, this isn't 
th- them saying, oh, well, we don't really like what you did, clearly. Yeah. All the reviews and everything. This is something that happened. It's he, so he, interesting how little we know. Uh, we'll learn a lot. Oh, yeah, more. yeah. This, you can't keep this quiet. People are going to be, I already, you already see Jeff Snyder sniffing around. Like some, <laughs> someone's going to find out some. This report's going to come out. This, we're going to, I mean, I don't buy the OnlyFans thing. He's been on that, I thought, since the, like the show was in development. Yeah. I don't know that, when he signed that, up, but that, that seemed public. That yeah, end, yeah. based off of everything I was seeing, because um, there were reports of what his OnlyFans was, it wasn't anything explicit. Right. It was just a, something that he was almost using similar to a Patreon, except mm-hmm. he was using it to cover uh, LGBTQ news, him being a queer man himself. Yeah. But... There is yes, there the, the streets are hot. But, but what Koi says, but what Koi says though, it's like if you when you because I saw someone go, you know, we talked about it the other day. I was like, they're not going to get rid of someone for the OnlyFans. Like, oh, you don't know practice and standards. They can get rid of someone right away. I'm like, but They've you don't think for Disney, a while. right? You don't think Disney's going to before when you when you hire someone, you, the first thing you do is you you mm-hmm. go. When I was when we were hiring somebody, really look, look at their Twitter. How bad is their Twitter? What have they done on Twitter? This is, you you look and it's like, well, he's got an OnlyFans. Like, yeah, but that's his own personal thing. Let's bring him on. That's what happened. Something else happened. It's so I think that Disney wouldn't be stupid enough. Knowing all of the backlash that happened with the gun situation, then having to rehire gun and everything else, I think that was a lesson learned. Right. Where, like, if there is something that had happened before we hired you, they yeah. have actually done their work now to deep dive. So something has to have happened in present time for sure. And something yeah. bad enough that they're willing to have this press the week of their X-Men. Mm-hmm. 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 That's it, what's crazy yeah. is it's now. I mean, Marvel is going through all this like, hey, things aren't as bad as you think they are because it's a very vocal internet contingent. I don't know how much the regular world sees sure. of the you know, things, the high uh, the up and downs, but we're the same people that are going to be talking about this firing. Right. The right. same people that are having the conversation of like, what's going on with Marvel are now like, what's going right. on? So something right. must have been big enough to allow this to come out this week yeah i don't know man i just think it's um it's so this you can't keep a lid on a story like this mm-hmm. so i think it'll it'll rear its ugly head potentially depending on what it is but it goes back to what you said the, he was all over this thing like he was all over this thing and he seems to really understand me. the x-men so that it, makes me nervous right because because the the if i if i remember correctly cole you might know better i believe They've already said that this is getting two to three seasons. I think season two is written already. And then then three is approved. Yeah, three is approved, but they haven't. Exactly. So, like, what concerns me in that regard is he, what, he wrote the pilot. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to say he also wrote episode two, but I could be wrong. But, again, he's the showrunner of the show. And the one thing that I know about a lot of shows if the showrunner is that integral to the show, when you just drop them, a lot of times you lose the soul of it, and that can get really scary. So, like, Community was never the same once Dan Harmon left. That's why they had to bring him back in. Uh, the Boondocks, I mm-hmm. love that show to the to, to the ends of the earth. Dexter. Dexter's, Dexter's another one. Yeah. The minute, like, uh, what, Aaron Magruder left Boondocks at the end of three, four was trash. Right. Uh, Dexter, when did the showrunner leave that Four one? after four. Came and that's back, about came back for the final season. And that was the Julius Stiles season, wasn't it? Because the Trinity no, Killer was season four, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, so after, he, didn't, he didn't work on the Julius Stiles season. Right. That's, right. The, that's right. when he left. So, right. like, it's one of those situations where I am very concerned yeah. that if that's the case, we might get two great seasons and then, and right. then we, it might go but, off a cliff. But, but to also be fair, there could be people that worked with him that understood it just as well that helped. Yeah, there's a lot of writers them. on it. And I know two of them. They're fantastic writers right. that really love the source really material. It's it. just what do you do with the position of power? Like, do you hire another showrunner? Do you upgrade mm. one of the writers? Right. Do you like that? That becomes a question. Yeah. So I don't know. What do you guys think? Let me know your thoughts um, about all of this. First of all, are you excited about the series? Do you think it's going to work? Are you excited about it? Comment and obviously weigh in on the on the controversy. Also, do you think that they can that this will be something that they can move forward with past the showrunner? Comment. Let me know. Now, before we move on, I want to tell you guys we are we're always excited to have sponsors that you guys uh, are are enjoying, and we've been getting some really great ones. And I want to tell you about two more right now. You guys know I love, um, you guys know that I love AG One, and you know that I love Factor. So I'm gonna tell you about both of them right now. Excited to talk to you guys about Factor, man. You know, it's not always easy to eat better, but it is with Factor. Because they have delicious, ready-to-eat meals. It's every one of them. is It's fresh. It's never frozen. It is chef-crafted. It's dietitian approved And it's ready to go. This is the best part. Two minutes. 
You'll have over 35 different options to choose from each week, whether it's Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, all of it. And there are more than 60 add-ons to help you stay fueled up and feeling good all day. What are you waiting for? Two-minute meals. And there's a lot of great stuff. Pancakes, smoothies. There's no prep. There's no mess meals. It's flexible for your schedule. Factor is the perfect solution if you're looking for fast, premium options with no cooking required. You just sign up and you save. You head to factormeals.com slash bigthing50, but you got to use that code, bigthing50. And what happens when you use bigthing50? You get 50% off. That's bigthing50 at factormeals.com slash bigthing50, and you get 50% off. All right, guys, let's talk about AG1. You guys know I love AG1. If you've been listening to my show, you've heard me talk about them, and I've been drinking them for about two years now, and I love it. Never been a vitamins guy. I've told you that. I take it all one shot. AG1. I put it in a water bottle. I shake it up. I'm good to go. I recommend AG1 to my friends. I recommend AG1 to my family. Everybody. AG1 is a team of doctors and scientists. It is tested for 950 contaminants and NSF certified for sport. It is formulated based on the latest science and maintains high quality standards. You guys know they've been with us for a while because you guys know too. You've all been checking them out, and everybody who's been signing up to AG1 says the same thing. It's changed your energy. It's changed how you approach things in a day. You're smiling more. You're running around the place, and you're sleeping better. I know. AG1 is the supplement that I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. That's why they've been a partner for so long. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and you get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3, K2, and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash big thing. Drinkag1.com slash big thing. Check it out. All right. Thank you to our friends over at AG1 and Factor. I have been very grateful to those of you who have reached out to me and I've seen some, some uh, whether it was on Instagram or Twitter telling me that you, or YouTube comments telling me that you have gotten both AG1 and Factor and that you're enjoying them. So thank you. Please do that. I always love hearing it. I want to hear what you guys think. So links in the description is always pinned to the top comment. All right, MCU Rumor Roundup. These are updates on Eternals 2, Henry Cavill's role, and possible spoilers. So... This is from Mark Cassidy, comic book movie. It's a big night for the MCU-related rumors with several different scoopers, some with better track rec- records than others, sharing updates on various projects. I'm going to start with the reliable Daniel Rickman, who is claiming that the quality over quantity approach Marvel Studios adapted after the underperformance of Ant-Man, Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania and the Marvels has led to the planned Eternal sequel being shelved for the time being. The studio is set to be putting all focus on guaranteed hits, whatever that means, which means we more than likely won't see a fourth Ant-Man or direct follow-up to the Marvels. No surprise there. Now, on to Venom, The Last Dance, and while the threequel will indeed be the final solo outing for Tom Hardy's Eddie Brock, Richmond has heard that Feige is open to having the lethal protector in the MCU proper for a potential face-off with Tom Holland's Spider-Man. As for the upcoming Blade reboot, Can We Get Some Toast is reporting that the movie is currently being retooled by writer Michael Green and will no longer be a period piece. Film is expected to take place in the UK. My Time to Shine Hello, meanwhile, believes that Barbie and the fall guy Ryan Gosling has accepted a role in the MCU. If accurate, we're not sure what he'll be playing, but there is speculation. It could be either Nova or Doctor Doom. (sighs) The Fantastic Four script has been compared to Little Women. She didn't elaborate, but we assume it's because both movies follow characters over two time periods. Recent rumors have claimed that the former Man of Steel, Henry Cavill, has joined the MCU in an undisclosed role. And Giant Freakin' Robot believes they know what character he'll play. All right, this is going to be a potential spoiler, so if you don't want to hear what he might play, move along. According to the site, Cavill will play a multiverse variant of Logan in Deadpool and Wolverine. We don't have much to go on there, but the Mission Impossible Fallout actor will reportedly be wearing a long brown coat when he shows up. How much stock should we play in this? The site has definitely had a few scoops that have panned out in the past, but just as many that have been nonsense, so it's difficult to know. If Cavill did sign on with Marvel, we find it hard to believe that it would be for a one-and-done cameo, so perhaps there are plans to bring the actor back in a different character down the line. All right, so let's move on to the next story. I want to talk a little bit about some of the upcoming MC rumors, one concerning Henry Cavill, one concerning Fantastic Four, a couple other ones. Here we go. 
All right, so you guys, you hear all of those rumors. You hear all that stuff. Coy, let's start with you, man. Out of all, everything that I just read there, what stands out to you? Baby Goose, man. I want Ryan Gosling in the MCU so bad. Uh, it's been talked about for like five years. Yeah. I think he's one of the last like movie stars. Yeah. He can do everything. And I think you want someone that is bankable, that is versatile, that carries a movie, that is a big enough above-the-line actor yeah. that you can have a character and an actor both be big enough that Marvel gets that you know mm-hmm. huge surge they need. Uh, I'd love to see him as a Cyclops. Um, I'd love to see him in like a a, a big commanding role. Uh, my buddy Yuri sees him as long shot, which I think would be hilarious. That would um, actually be really he'd good. be perfect. I just don't know if that character would be as yeah, big as know what that is. Uh, long shot's a guy that kind of, he's kind of like black cat. He plays with luck. So he's a character that his power is making long shots happen. So mm-hmm. he's, I thought that's more of a domino thing. Black cat. I thought black cat's whole thing is Bad more, I, but I see, I thought bad. I thought Black Cat's thing, and maybe this is where the Spider-Man the animated series is throwing me off. That she has like some her own version of the Super Soldier Serum, and that's why. No, that's that's only the that's, animated that's series. The animated in, series. in the okay. movie, I mean, in the comics, she basically around her bad luck happens everyone but her. Hmm, so it's okay. like the inverse of the domino. inverse of domino. Uh, yeah. But I, I see, you know, like a, a long shot visually dynamic and perfect, especially with his current hair. But uh, I'd love to see him in like a Cyclops role. I, I think Gosling is. He's the right age mm-hmm. for his kids to care enough that he might do it. Well, he's like what? He's got to be close to 40 now? I think right? he's early 40s. Is he? Okay. So he could, if you have Pedro Pascal, who's 46, 47, he could play Doom. Yeah, but I, I, I don't I don't like that casting. No. I really... He, he has no Paul Giamatti. We've seen, uh, well, <laughs> yeah, sure, like but that's it. a whole different reason why yeah, I yeah. said that. <laughs> I just after after what I've heard about the Fall Guy, and I've I've heard that he crushes that. What he did in Barbie, and especially that performance of I'm just Ken and all that, and and he just gives off that particular vibe. It doesn't mean that he couldn't play a villain. hundred there, percent could. There, there's just different villains that you could give him that charisma. Doom isn't charismatic in the way that Ryan Gosling is. Doom is very about his business and very command. That's why we kept saying Cavill. There's that thing about Cavill that I think would be really good. And I hate the idea of Cavill as Logan because not that he couldn't give you that gruff thing that you're looking for, but I agree with a lot of people that feel some type of way that like, look, if a super tall person is just going to be the person to be Logan, fine. But there is something specific about Wolverine being right. a shorty and that saber tooth is way above him and that's yeah. his main rival. I hate that Wolverine r- rumor. I hate that Wolverine. I, I don't like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I, t- yeah. I, I still uh, Edgerton. I still think that he would be uh, Taron Edgerton would be better. He would, oh, totally. But Taron Edgerton. I mean, well, this is just seems like this is going to be like one off. A one off. Which Cameo. I think is. is well, I don't agree with waste him. That's what I'm saying. I agree yeah. with Cavill. Unless movie. that's all that Cavill him? wants to do. I, I can't imagine Cavill wants to sign on for another ten years of dealing with fans. Uh, I don't think he has a problem with the fans, dude. As much he's, a, I think it's for him. He had a lot of support from the fans. Oh no, the fans a, love him. I just yeah. mean, like, do you want your lifestyle to be only comic book? Movies? I know. I think it's more so the fact that like he has been working for the studio system. If that, that was that's, if that's one thing. I mean, the like the weight of it. Not, yeah. not. I'm not saying he doesn't like the fans. He right. loves the fans, yeah, and yeah, he's yeah. a nerd. I'm not saying any of that. I'm saying, does he want to pivot from 15 years in one house to the next 10 years in another sure, house? Sure. And the that's weight different. of being that, stuck there. Yeah. I don't mean the fans as in they're the problem. I mean like his life becomes that again right what are you gonna say well you got one if you're gonna pick him to be any sort of regenerating whatever i can't believe i just missed what i said you could make him saber tooth and i think that would actually be a pretty good cast yeah that would be good and then the other thing that i thought about if you really want to use gosling i actually think again tied to x-men you could make him mr sinister and he would crush oh, that yeah, he would absolutely he, crush sinister yes he would the only problem he'd be great. with putting him in the x-men right now is that when do you want to use him? Do you want to use Ryan Gosling to help sell the Fantastic Four? Do you want to use Ryan Gosling in before the Avengers? Or do you want to say, no, no, we got him signed on, but you're not going to see him until like 2027 in a Marvel movie. I think Gosling could absolutely do the Doom thing and be great. But Doom is, it's funny to laugh at Doom yelling in all caps. Like when you see Doom, it's funny in a, in a non-charming way. And and Gosling is so good at being charming. I think he would be a bit wasted in Fantastic Four. So yeah. I see, you know, while he's the hottest out he's been right. using him. But I think it'd be better to use him for a character that's better suited for him. And Marvel's good at casting long term. Yeah. So I honestly, like, I love your sinister pick. Dude, I think and they might do Sinister so, for the first X-Men movie. Well, I, they why set him up five times. Do something like new. Don't automatically jump back into the whole Magneto thing all over again. I, I, on top of the fact that, like, the more I think about Doom, if I was going to 
kind of blend him between like two movie characters that come to mind. It would be a mix of like Agent Smith and then like Candy from from uh, Leonardo's Candy from mm-hmm. uh, uh, Django. Django. Thank you. Uh, it's it's the insanity mm-hmm. that Leo shows when he like had the blood on his yeah. hand and all that kind of stuff. But then also the cold, calculated nature of Smith and putting those, the, he can be either one of those. I'm not saying that Ryan Gosling and, and Henry Cavill don't, I, I think Henry would probably be a little closer to it. I'm not saying that Ryan doesn't have the chops to do it. It's just not necessarily what he, he oozes charisma, yeah. which is why Sinister for me, I That's feel like it'd be a, a good great pull. And I like your saber to the pull too. I, I, I want someone like giant and beastly and Henry Cavill's huge. It'd be great. Uh, yeah. Alan Rickman, I guess, if you're not going to do Cavill. Oh, for dude, yeah. dream. Yeah, I think that that's one Richardson. of the... Yeah, Thank you. Rickman think, passed yeah, away. Yeah, Rickman. I'm because of the the, the news reporter. That's what. Right, right, right. Uh, I think that. Um, the, I mean, look. There's a lot of stuff that they are saying. Even the one of the rumors in the beginning of it is that Marvel is looking to do just guaranteed hits. And I said, whatever that means, because you can't ever like do what a <laughs> guarantee. Such a dumb. Uh, it, phase one was like, let's have a C list character, a D list character. Right, there's a no, there's no like, guaranteed hit. Then no matter what, I mean, no, no, like Avatar three, right? Is not a guaranteed. <laughs> if it's real bad, it's not a guaranteed hit. It's going to be a massive success. Yeah, but it's not. Nothing's guaranteed. It's, nothing is guaranteed. It's true. The only reason, though, I understand why they're coming at it in that particular way. And I know we less all, risk. all get that. Less risk well, is a name. Less risk would have been the better way to yes. go with it. But I think the other thing we have to remember is, in w- how ridiculous Dire Straits like Marvel was when Iron Man happened and they went out on that plan. You move so differently than when you're like dirt poor to like I'm now I'm super rich right. to now I've lost my fortune. How do I build it back up? Yeah. You're a very different type of person than when I've never had anything. So I don't think you can go and try and replicate phase one. That's not something you can do, but you can see why that worked and see the clout that you have and come up with a new solution. Right. And and I guess it's one of those things we see a lot of times with like musicians. That debut album is incredible. The sophomore slump kind of kicks in and then it's like how do you recapture the artistry that brings you back to it? That's what I need to see out of Marvel right now and I think that that's what they're trying to say mm-hmm. is what is it that made us special? Sure. I, I, I get what they were going for. It's just Abs- bad wording. Yeah, it's just it's, if for Marvel to say we're only going for guaranteed hits. I'm like I mean, yeah, that's that's what every studio goes for is guaranteed hits. But but I understand their approach is right. It's like, let's go for more recognizable stuff. Let's stop just putting out everything. Let's stop putting out. They 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 got into a place because they were hit after hit after hit. Well, look, everyone uses Guardians as the example. Well, nobody knew Guardians and Guardians is a massive hit. You were rich then. And it was a different phase. It was and, and the trust was a lot different with the fans back then. It, it, is, it is a thousand percent that that same adage I was using with the musician would have, at that point you've earned so yes. much clout that it's like, I'll listen to your experimental album. Wow, that was actually pretty good. Right. Well, staying with that Cavill part of it, that comic book movie actually did um, a, a little bit of a, a list of certain characters, and there's going to be some characters, I'm sure, in this list. That I don't know what the hell it is, but that's why you guys are here, to tell me if you agree or disagree. We've done this before with comic book movie, and here is the list. All right, comic book movie. This is from Josh Wilding. Rumors that Henry Cavill might join the MCU have persisted for several years. However, it was last night that we learned that the former Superman is supposedly being lined up to play a Wolverine variant in Deadpool Wolverine. But after he was fired by DC and James Gunn following him, I don't know if he was fired. This wasn't brought back. It's not (laughs) fired. Um, Anyway, Cavill deserves another shot at being a superhero or a supervillain for that matter. Beyond playing Superman, Cavill has proven himself as an actor capable of playing all manner of characters on screen. So these are the suggestions for a comic book movie. The first, whoever this is, this is <laughs> Beta Ray Bill. Beta Ray Bill. Um, okay, it looks like a guy with a horse head. What is this? Created by Walt Simonson. He's a is a Corbinite and a member of an alien race whose planet was destroyed by Surtur. I'm, I'm bored already. Cho- chosen by his people to wield the most the Stormbreaker. He lives the Thor's hammer. No. Uh, I one of the most what iconic right? characters in Thor. You're like, no, no, I'm good. No. No. Thanks. Silver Surfer. Okay, no, now I, I know who that, that is. I don't hate that. All right, Silver Surfer is an example, and we know who Silver Surfer is. Now, for now, it appears that Silver Surfer won't join Galactus in the Fantastic Four reboot. Instead, the Devourer of Worlds has will be joined by another Herald, with the door left open for Norrin Rad to make an appearance. Okay, next one, Beast. That's hmm. interesting, so they're not going to go... Just because his name is Henry. They're not going to go back with, uh, <laughs> with Kelsey Grammer. So the rumor... 
Mill may have turned up some some wild claims about Cavill playing Wolverine, but there's another member that we think he'd be a better fit for. Yes, we're talking about the one and only Dr. Henry Hank McCoy. Uh, this won't work if Marvel Studios decides to introduce the mutant team as teens, but if they're already established uh, as heroes after Avengers Secret Wars, then we think it'd be a perfect fit. Okay. This is number two, Dr. Doom. This is my pick. This is the one mm -hmm. that I want. Mm -hmm. Dr. Doom is rumored to make his MCU debut post credit scene, presumably meaning the actor cast of the villain will only need to lend their voice to the character for the time being. We'll eventually get to see what lies beneath the mask, of course, and Havel going to toe-to-toe -to -toe with Pedro Pascal's Mr. Fantastic is exciting. Last one, number one, Captain Britain. This is the one that everybody has been talking about. So I don't know if enough about Captain Britain, but we we know this is predictable, but damn it, we don't care. Cavill will be perfect, uh, helping to ensure this superhero feels believable and every bit is crucial to the MCU. Okay, so I like most of those. I, I mean, I agree that I don't know enough about Captain Britain, but he, even Henry Cavill himself said that'd be like kind of a, the, the one that is the most obvious. Dr. Doom is the one that I would love. That's the one I've been calling for for I, I like years, <laughs> years now at this point. Um, I like the ch the choice of the beast. Uh, I think I think that's an interesting choice, and I think that Henry Cavill could absolutely. I could see him holding a clipboard and and having that conversation like all dressed in blue. I could absolutely see it. I don't know who that first per first person is. I don't care. <laughs> well, oh, uh, the, Beta Ray Bill. Uh, he's Thor, like a, he's Thor. like a Thor from another planet. He's no, he's someone like fighting for the same. No, yeah, he no, thank you. Care. No, thank you. He's like he has a horse face. I don't want a horse I'm face. Yeah. If we're going with those. I would say probably Doom is my one and Beast would be my two. And, yeah. and that and then Britain the, three. Yeah. Same. Uh, uh Surfer four and, and Beta yeah. Ray Bill five. I think specifically the one thing I will give him for Beast, and that's maybe part of the reason why I was leaning so hard into Doom. Mm -hmm. The fact that we got a behind the scenes of Cavill uh, after, like, I want to say Man of Steel or Batman v Superman, where, like, ladies were losing their minds. Yeah. It's like, oh, I like to build computers on my spare time. And then all of a sudden they were like, oh, my God. <laughs> right, yeah, big nerd. Yeah. I, I Do you think... know who he was a massive fan of? Uh, Schnapp. Yeah. He was a massive yeah. fan. I didn't know that. He, yeah, he loved Schnapp. Yeah. He loved Schnapp. Yeah. I, so I, who I'll, didn't? I mean, right. Yeah. 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 Um, but that's how plugged in he was that he was like internet yeah, aware. Right. He knew. I loved yeah. That. He he actually when when Schnepp passed away he did a post about yeah. him. I don't even know if wow. they even really met each other too much, but he was just a fan of Schnepp. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, love yeah. Cavill yeah. for that. Yeah. But I I think to that point he could both give you the the bestial side of Beast, but he can tap into that nerd element clearly, and I think that 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 would be great. But that's also why I think he'd be so great for Doom. We saw him yeah. in Mission Impossible and how he can bring you that big bad as much as he needs. To and you're just giving him a different flavor of you know of that type of villain. So I'm, yeah. I don't know how well they do a Captain Britain. Like I, Is I feel Britain like a bad guy. No, no it's I want it, him it's. To be. It, you want him as a bad guy? I want him like, a bad guy. Yeah, bad guy. Yeah, I, I just guy. don't know if they do Excalibur. I don't know if they dive into like if Guy Ritchie wanted to do Excalibur, I'd be interested. Like if someone that loves making the British yeah. texture and flavor yeah. have that punchiness. Yeah. But if it was just like Captain America, but Britain, I'm like not as invested. But it's also the same. Com the conversation that we just had. One is Captain Britain enough of the guaranteed hit, right? That's, that's a funny. Part. That's one part of it. The other thing is like, if so, if they just they just bring him on to do a Captain Britain thing, when does that movie come out? Right, right. Doctor Doom, you're gonna see him soon, right? Silver Surfer, you'll probably see him soon. Um, Beast, you'll see him soon enough. Those are the three out of those that you're like, okay, that's more realistic as far as well. You want to place him in there and get some star power in there and put a little bit more oomph to it. I still think Doctor Doom is the way to go. I think that he's imposing. I think that the fact that he, you know, you like they said, you could use his voice for a little bit, and then when it comes down to when he, uh, you imagine that reveal, yeah, in Secret Wars or whatever, when he takes the mask off and it's Henry Cavill, the place goes crazy. And like the intensity in his eyes, I think you need someone that also has that gaze. And that's that's one of the reasons I do like the Killian Murphy room, right? There's a lot of reasons I don't because of the stature yeah. and certain things, but like the intense gaze through the mask I think is so essential. Sure. Like that like condescending. And I feel like Henry Cavill would be fun to see him play that. I think he'd enjoy it. And the big. language of Beast would be great. I, I really think that yeah. Cavill being such a like computer building, Warcraft like purveying nerd it would be great to hear him get to like show that side of himself yeah. that he only really shows in interviews because you see him in interviews like someone's talking about nerdery he perks up and he's attentive and you don't get right. to see that in he's like Lothario romance cover right, right right so I'd like to see Beast I think I think Doom's my one Beast is my two I don't love the Silver Surfer just because I see him as a lot more stoic mm -hmm. and I've always seen more of like a, a, a Keanu Reeves like wistful type like someone that like kind of just like flows and and Cavill's intense whereas 
To me, the surfer is an observer, and Cavill seems to be someone that is engaged. Engaged. Okay. Well, out of all that, where do you guys go with Cavill? What do you want to see? Put your comments in there. Let us know. Uh, before we get to, we have just two more stories left. Before we get to both of them, I want to tell you guys both about Robin Hood and Mando. Let me tell you about both of them right now. Let me tell you about, about Robin Hood. This is, a, this is a new one. So did you guys know that even if you have a 401k for retirement that you can still have an IRA? Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe on Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from, from other ret in retirement accounts with a 3% match. And that's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer, is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal info. Claims as of Q1 2024 validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investigating, excuse me, inv excuse me, investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial is a registered broker dealer. Hey, you. You want to smell like a zero? What does that mean? Well, I'm going to tell you. In a clinical study, men who showered with soap and used Mando whole body deodorant in their pits had an odor score of zero after 12 hours that means no odor that's why i love it i hate when you put on deodorant you're like oh my pits smell great and then an hour later you smell like an alley cat i don't want that because the other thing that they did a study on is men who showered with just soap had an armpit odor score of 8 out of 10 after 12 hours big odor so this is why we introduced mando from the makers of lumi deodorant Mando is clinically proven to control odors for 72 hours. It doesn't matter where you stink. It could be your pits, your package, your feet, and beyond. You got to make the switch to Mando whole body deodorant, and you're going to smell like a zero every day. They sent this man, and I was like, all right, let me test it out. Let me see. No stink. New customers will get $5 off a starter pack with our exclusive code and link. You got to use that code big thing at shopmando.com. That's shopmando.com. Use the code big thing at shopmando.com. All right. Thank you to our friends over at Robinhood and Mando. As I said, if you can, you have the means to make sure you go visit one of our sponsors. Let me know if you do. Okay. Let's move on to this. We just watched this, guys. Crow, this new trailer. Now, we talked about this a little while ago on this show about how, and, and I still don't love the look of the crow or, or you know they had to kind of change it up a bit from the classic almost like the the, the kiss look mm. the, and now it's it's different and i didn't know what to expect from this trailer this trailer was bonkers it was amazing yeah this trailer was bonkers it the really trailer is i still agree the the imagery is not for me because yeah. i like that he kind of mirrored uh like a, a traditional clown mime yeah. like there was something unnerving about it being innocent and, yes. and changed, whereas this look is is just aggressive. Yep. Um, so I don't know if that would be, you know, a problem for me. Like, you know what I mean? Like, there's an no, innocence no, no. to it. I understand. I was laughing because I, I could see you on your camera, and I was like, oh, yeah. Like, I mean, there is something about Sting when you were watching wrestling that you would go, oh, yeah. This yeah. Is and then I was like, yeah, Sting. Oh, that's not Sting. That's literally the crow. Yeah, yeah, that's, the crow. <laughs> that's, that's why I You know what's funny about that is Sting recently said, uh, recently, he's like, "Oh, I actually wasn't based off of uh, the Crow. It was based off of uh, Kiss." And then there's actual footage of, uh, and I love Sting, but there's actual footage of like Razor Ramon or Scott Hall saying that he he hadn't seen, Sting hadn't seen Crow, but uh, Scott Hall had recommended because it was a big movie. That's where he Scarface was that's Razor funny. Ramon, right, right. and he suggested the Crow to him, and that's where it came from. So it's like, <laughs> come on, Sting. Uh, but yeah, it's like, but it, that's that that is the Crow. That is right there. At the, I mean, quick. Can you bring that? Yeah, yeah. Just show that one. I love that's one of my favorites. Um, yeah, it's really, I love that. 
You should see the original though, Winston, before you see the new. You think? I, yeah. yeah. I, I would see the original. Because I, I, I wonder, in the same way that you with X Men '97, that you. That's true. Had, we went a different eyeline. It just gives a different eyeline of if like I what have is no, the first one that you see. I mean, you, that's true. You could always see this I one could just first. Do the controlled experiment. You, yeah, you could, could be see, our like, what do you consider the crow? Because right. if you see this as your foundation, you might have a different take altogether on. True, what, what and, they do. and you could compare it after you see you, you see this one first because what was interesting watching it with you this trailer was that you didn't really know too much about the story so going into it like we had we, different pops we knew like when when it, when it was starting and we're like oh this never gets easy the beginning of that yeah thing. and to this day that scene with Shelly is one of the most painful it's rough it like it's hard to watch knowing it's kind of like you said knowing it's coming it's still like that first movie is so good at making violence unpleasant right. i think a lot of times violence is fun like john wick is fun violence right but the crow makes violence unpleasant until right. the crow is doing it and i think that's one and of the most interesting and rough. even then it's, it's rough but it's yeah. not there's something really interesting about violence where uh and i talk about this all the time so apologies viewers but like there, it, we've made sexuality and nudity and all those things the perversion and we've made violence the accepted entertainment like we are entertained by violence and beheadings and punching and all these things and like sex is natural and violence isn't and it's really interesting the crow is one of my favorite examples of violence used i think well because he's a character that is uh like the punisher but they frame violence so differently in that when violence is being done to the innocent, it feels awful. When things are being done to Eric and Shelly, right. it feels horrendous. But when he's getting revenge, the way they uh, Alex Proe shoots it, the way that's written, all those things, you're suddenly like, this is vindictive vengeance. This violence feels deserved. And it's, and it's incredible because it's a flip of a switch. And I feel like a lot of times we make all violence celebrated, and I think that's dangerous. But I think a good movie shows where violence can be a negative and where vengeance is deserved. It, and I think The Crow's a great example. Well, especially look, I'm not, I, as I said, I'm not a big Rupert Sanders fan, but trailer's great. I'll tell you, this trailer was good the way that they said it, and because I even like how they dove a little bit more into the lore, mm -hmm. and they show, and I said it in our trailer reaction, it looked like the the Sandman at one point where it's like, okay, we're gonna let you go back, and here's what you got to do, and here's what you can accept now that you're going back, and in the original, it's just like you just back, yeah, and so a little bit more of that, depending on how they do it, you could now. The same on the same note, we could watch it Be and like, go. Oh, why did they add that? I wish they didn't add that scene because in the original, it's interesting him trying to figure out what happened and him right. being disoriented. Right. And there's that communication with the crow that isn't like they're talking, but there's a communication right. that is how he figures it out. Right. Like he's got the guidance. little girl. He's got yeah, the little girl, little girl too girl. that he talks to. But yeah. the crow is kind of like a spirit guide. Right. If he's got a human right. in right. the underground, that's kind of like hey, it, that negates. It depends. We'll see how they do. It, it depends on how they do it. So very interesting. I. But I'll tell you, I really enjoyed all three of us. Really enjoyed the trailer more so than we thought. Like that's and that's one of those things. I love being surprised like that. I love being surprised to where you're like, I don't know about this one. I'm, I'm always sure. happier to be pleasantly yes. surprised than like Bump. not like something. Right. right. <laughs> I, I mean, I think the reason why a lot of us have a bad taste in our mouth for reboots is because people keep doing them poorly. Right. So if you actually are going to do a reboot and you're going to do something that's so phenomenal that I'm like, this just expands my love for this. Yeah. And when you change genre correctly, this doesn't look the same as The Crow. Uh, it no. looks like a very different atmosphere, and I think that it looks like, more John Wick. It does, yeah. and and Mr. and Mrs. Smith is a remake of a Hitchcock movie, mm. and then there's got a new remake on Amazon, and I think a lot of people forget the Angelina and Brad Pitt one is a Hitchcock Hitchcock film. Mm. So I, I think it's like when you think of that movie, now you think of the new one. It doesn't make the old one go away, but they didn't try to make another Hitchcock movie because that wasn't the goal of that movie. Is that so, true? Yeah, I didn't Mr. Know Mrs. That. Smith, yeah, that's know that's that. a point, right? Yeah. Like Mr. and Mrs. Smith, we think of an action movie because mm -hmm. that's the one of our generation. There's a classic Hitchcock film oh. that precedes it by 40 years. So yeah. if you make something that is that is new and it's different enough, then you get two great movies instead of trying to make one thing again. Oh. 50 years, a nice, comedy nice. thriller. Oh, wow. makes right. sense. I mean, that's kind of what it is now. Comedy. It's your new tidbit of the day. Look at that. <laughs> um, okay, so thoughts on the trailer, guys? What'd you think? All right, let's do the last story, then Winston's got to get the hell out of here. Okay, so this is the last story. We, talk, we covered this last week. We talked about the, uh, the Zack Snyder interview on Joe Rogan. Well, DC writer Grant Morrison hits back at Justice League director Zack Snyder's comments about Batman killing. DC Comics writer Grant Morrison has shared his take on Zack Snyder's recent remarks about Batman's no-kill rule, arguing that it's a fundamental part of what makes Bruce Bruce. Last week, an interview with Zack Snyder was published, which saw the filmmaker justify his decision to have Ben Affleck's Dark Knight kill in Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. The director, who had also had Superman defeat General Zod by snapping his neck in Man of Steel, 
His deconstruction of his point of view of superheroes and added, people are always like Batman can't kill, so Batman can't kill his canon. And I'm like, okay, well, the first thing I want to do when you say that is I want to see what happens. He'd later go on to say, and they go, well, don't put him in a situation where he has to kill someone. And I'm like, well, that's just you protecting your God in a weird way, right? You're making your God irrelevant. Snyder's take on Batman's no kill, kill rule has split options, and prolific comic book writer Grant Morrison has now shared a rebuttal. They're well-versed in what makes the Cape Crusader tick, uh, having spent years writing the Heroes DC comic series. Morrison also introduced Damian Wayne Robin. I was reading how film director Zack Snyder thinks Batman should kill as part of the character's self-imposed mission to stop crime. If Batman killed his enemies, he'd be the Joker, and Commissioner Gordon would have to lock him up. That Batman puts himself in danger every night but steadfastly refuses to murder is an essential element of the character's magnificent, horrendous, childlike psychosis. They explain that fundamental to Batman's grandeur as a fictional adventure hero is this not obvious? Okay, so Koi, this is pretty much everything that you just said last week. <laughs> hey, man, oh, really? yeah. Yeah. They tried to come for you too, bro. I saw it because we put it, we put an IG version yeah. of it out, and they were like, "Did you not see eighty nine? Did you not?" See just because Batman killed before in other mediums doesn't mean it's relevant to make him do it again. Yeah, they're all else like they're all versions of a character. That's the beauty of an archetypal character. That doesn't mean it's the character. The problem is when you make the character different to that level, it no longer is that character. Like it, it's literally as simple as that becomes a new character. If he doesn't kill the Joker, there is no yin and yang. I mean, like, that's the point, is he would never kill, and Joker should be killed. You're supposed to look at it morally and go, Batman has a view that I don't share. Let me understand him. His entire, Snyder's entire thing was, let me look at the morals. Let me dissect. Let me, and I like that Snyder does that, but in the case of Batman killing, it's not dissecting anything. It's being wrong. It's, it's, you don't get to dissect if you don't question it. If he goes, oh, he killed him, that's Punisher. He's got guns. Like, right, that's right. not a character. It's the crow. It's the, crow. <laughs> like, the Batman's yeah. whole thing is that his parents were killed by guns. He won't kill. Batman using guns in general is insanely foolish to the character. And him yep. killing is just him causing more hymns. He doesn't want anyone to ever feel like what he felt like in that alleyway. Yeah. He doesn't know these henchmen have children or not. If he's killing them, Bro. that takes away every bit of the fundamental of what Batman is. One of the most powerful storylines, I would say, and it started off really wonky, obviously, the death of Jason Todd and all that, and mm -hmm. then, like the, the voting in and barely yeah. one, et cetera, right? But I think one of the things, and I know what happened in some of the books, but it was done super well in Under the Red Hood, the, the animated movie, of him having a conversation being like, you didn't kill this freak, specifically him. I get you don't kill, but he took me. If he had killed me, I would go to the ends of the earth to put him in the ground. And it makes sense why Jason slips into that darkness because right. he died, came back from the Lazarus. But there's all sorts of stuff there, right? The fact that Bruce tells Dick, tells Jason, tells everybody, no, because then we're no better. If you were going to challenge it, if you were going to give me in those movies that Bruce had a situation where he truly broke and that's who he is now and then superman inspires him to fix his code that's one thing that's not what you did you just said screw it he's just out here shooting people as blowing up flamethrowers like it doesn't it just didn't you didn't tell us anything you just did it because you wanted to if and the you, psychosis of batman is essential and I, I love what morrison says like his childlike psychosis Batman isn't mentally well. Right. He doesn't use his money to solve problems. He uses his money to dress like a giant bat and beat up the mentally ill on the streets of Gotham. He, we need Batman to be someone to go like, hey, that's really cool. You're not good. Like, bro. And, and like, there's no why I love Michael Keaton's Batman. I don't I don't. He's not my Batman. I love Michael Keaton's Batman. But when I look at Michael Keaton, the psychosis is there. And when like they cut to him at right. the Oscars in one frame, I was like, that's Batman. I personally think that you need someone that you can you're concerned about mentally. Mm -hmm. And that is why him having that line in the sand is so insane, because we know fundamentally Gotham would be safer if Joker was dead. We need to question his sanity. Also, the use of Snyder's the, he, he's like your gods. The point of Batman is a mortal among gods. And, right, and I know exactly. he's it's a figure of speech, but him even considering Batman a god when there's an actual pantheon of gods is, to me, another fundamental misunderstanding of the character. Well, it's, it's, it's because also that whole situation of because he's with those gods and those gods actually revere him right. as a mortal, you, you can't. You have to separate him out in some form or fashion. And and on, on, including the fact that when you look at Soups and Wonder Woman, 
it's a whole different thing in the sense of like kind of them pulling back because of the insane strength that they have and all that. Whereas as a human, if you're that terrified when you're fighting these type of villains, it's like, wow, you didn't, I would have killed them if yeah. I were in your shoes because my life is in danger. And yet somehow Bruce figures out a way to beat them to a pulp sometimes, yeah. but like still a lot. And that's also the fun question of like, if someone's legs are broken, arms are broken, they're in a coma. Is that better than just killing them? And we want that question of like, he's so psychotic. He thinks that they're having a pulse means that's better than killing them. Like literally Batman's broken people's legs and, and that, like, left. Enough, but yeah. he's torturing them in that regard. And that's way more psychotic than just taking someone out. So I, I just, I, I really like Zach, the man. I really like the, the movies he built as an Elseworld, but I think that it's, it's so detrimental that an entire generation think those, the, the, the characters like the Jacob Elordi from Saltburn said he didn't want to play Superman because it's too dark of a character character superman for an entire generation is too dark of a character that is is so horrible so i just wish that snyder fans understood that yes you love that character and i appreciate you loving that character but that's not the character it's a version of the character that i personally think isn't the true one well he doesn't have much to say on the matter <laughs> <laughs> so what do you guys think about it? Do you think uh, uh, any one of your thoughts, put them out there about if you agree with the stuff that there's one side of it is certainly doing debate and healthy debate. We hope happens here and it has been so far. So make sure you do all that. I want to thank both Winston and Corey for joining us. Starting Winston. Winston, where can I find you? Find me at the Swaggy Blurred on all the platforms, man. Come say what's up. I got some fun stuff popping up on the socials. You can find me at Koi Jandro, Twitter, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, and you can find me in theaters in October now instead of November watching Venom The Last Dance. Best subtitle I've had in a long time. So excited about that last dance. Not sure how long you can find them on TikTok, though. So, so make <laughs> sure you also, if you haven't already, subscribe to this channel. We're on Apple Podcasts. We're on Spotify. If you are into the UAP phenomenon, we have an entire news channel every day. We put out a new story. That is Down to Earth with Christian Harloff. Make sure you subscribe today. And thanks for joining us. And we'll see you on the flip side. Bye.